being said, we are excited to welcome you to the first official event of the celebration of Dr. Alan Lavin for his 45 years of contribution. <laughs> You will well know that not all 45 of those years were serving as a role of director of debate. And we're excited to have some people in the audience who weren't necessarily on the debate team, but are here to come and hear from Dr. Lavin anyway. That being said, 30 of those years was as the director of debate. This book that we have in front of us that I'll be using and talking about, um, you all are all going to get a copy of this evening at the dinner. There's one waiting for you there. And you'll notice that the longest serving director of debate in the history of the program dating back to 1835 is Dr. Alan Lavin. So what better person? <laughs> what better person for us to get an afternoon of conversation with. Now we do have a hard out at 3.30 because hopefully you all remember we're doing a dedication of the plaque memorial that's right out front of Carswell Hall. Of course, we don't necessarily have to race over there, but there are some people who are not coming to this that have indicated they will be there for that. So I'll be trying to pay a little bit of attention to the time, but other than that, we will keep it more or less free flowing. So with that being said, Dr. Loud, any opening remarks before we jump in? Well, Jared, there, there are people in the audience, who, uh, this is what I'm thrilling about, the growing crowd. There are people in the audience who couldn't race over that they wanted to. We'll get there of our own due course, yes. Yeah, so what was the question again? Well, first, is Dr. Lowndes' mic close enough for you all to hear him, or should we instruct him to have it a little closer? I'm getting some a little, little bit closer. closer. A little closer. If they laugh louder, it's closer. <laughs> okay. Is that better? Is that better? Yeah. Excellent. Okay. All right. So the first question I had was, do you have any opening remarks? We know you have a speech this evening, so we don't need you to do yeah, that speech, but that just got done. So I kind of, if I open my mouth, that might come out. So <laughs> All right, so then maybe we'll just dive right in then. Okay, we'll dive right in. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so I'm excited for us to break this into a couple of parts, but the first one is about the book. So this is the third volume of what will be a three volume set on the history of weight debate. Please tell everyone in the audience what they should expect when they get this third volume and why it is the third volume that's coming out first. Well, yeah, it, it, it's heavy. You should expect that. It's <laughs> heavy. heavy. I don't know why, but it is. Uh, it's uh, why the third volume first. That's because what we have. I got about 6,000 partially organized files on my computer for the other two volumes, but as you produce the other two volumes and do the background research, you find all this stuff. And we had been building lists for years. And some of these lists are brand new, to me anyway, in terms of that. Uh, this is really kind of fun because we didn't live in the archives. We probably should have spent more time there. But telling you what the archive, the university runs the university archives is actually here with us. This is way cool. Okay. And uh, so we got to know those folks pretty well and they put up with us. Uh, they stayed in separate rooms, but they put up with us. <laughs> so it was great fun. Um, some parts of this are deceptively easy looking. It's kind of fun to go look through the old topics of the Philomathesians and the New Zealands that go back to 1835. But they kept records of everything. So you go in there in the library, we have a few more to fill in yet, but they're fun just to read the topics because it's like a social and political history and also a history of whether they thought they should be engaged in society or not in terms of what they talked about, because there was definitely this, we will talk about, you know, poetry and whether Roman generals did the wrong thing for a number of years. But in Mary Queen of Scots, they worried about locking her head off about 45 times in those topics. Let's give a little flavor, shall we? This is what you found. So, May 13th, 1849. Which is more mischief, gaming or drunkenness? <laughs> One week later, in 1849, is France likely to remain a republic in the next 50 years? So they definitely wow. had that alternating flavor of topics that were... And then there were time periods for it that should be tuned in the narrative version we talk about how those all worked and the kind of patterns that were coming and that kind of thing. Pascal in the first three volumes does a pretty good job on the resolutions, but I think we've learned a lot more since then. How do you get every one of those damn lines in there? 
meant you went to a ledger of huge and you tried to read the cursive writing of an 18 year old in 1837. The meeting they say that it happened. So you're tracking these things down. So every one of those, and then transcribing them and trying to figure out your format and everything else, it goes on for lots of pages for the topics. You presume that both sides won that first topic. And it was a tie today, I don't know. Um, I, but you, it's really interesting, and, and it was, they were hard to get. The other sections, particularly, that I enjoyed probably the most was the section on the oratorical tradition of Wake Forest. Tell everybody a little about that, because <coughs> I want to quickly highlight the contributions that Dr. Loud made here are not limited to Wake Debate. This section was missing first. The dean's office thought they had a list going back. Or you elaborate. Yeah, the dean's office had a, a list of convenience in a sense of who their current oratory winners were, because we have the oratory contests right every year, which used to be central to graduation and central to parties and everything. We should have moved that away so we could have more. No, we have more people graduating. It's not more administrative talk for graduation, is it? That would be kind of tacky for me to say. I keep saying these tacky things recently and enjoying them. And I say, I say, fire me, please. You know, go for it. What was I talking about? Give us the, tradi the oratorical tradition. How early does it start? What role did it play? The oratorical tradition, I call it that. The Dean Mullen actually had done somewhere in the 90s had commissioned out of his office uh, a historical sketch of all the oratories that people have ever given in the history publicly. And, uh, and it was pretty good. And it was more than just the winners of that particular contest, although that's primarily what it was. And so I said, I'm not going to go there. I know what this is going to mean. It's going to mean weeks of archival work and checking. And then, of course, once I got started, I couldn't quit. And uh, so what that does is it, everybody who spoke publicly, from graduation to events, to all kinds of occasions and things, to 18, starting in 1835. The oratories were, in a couple of cases, published. The library, I think it's just, Tony, you correct me, but I believe they just had, we had two of the first five. And, and then the staff kind of come up with titles for them. They didn't have titles. So some of this is out of whole cloth in one level. But it's really not. And so we did not only the commencement speakers, not only the oratory winners, not only the public events, Founders Day, Society Day, all the kind of public social events that they built their year around as students. And so all those are collected there. The more fun ones are the ones on the debate, public debates of literary societies, which I think you're checking on 18. Uh, 1830 or 50 something, when they finally went public, they had a lot of basic societies. They didn't go public to like a graduation and things like that. And some of these are searing. An example is a debate on what we should do about post slavery African Americans in this country at a public debate, in which is being garnered and to find the judge, et cetera, by the governor, et cetera, and the whole legislature's there. It kind of worked that way in those days. And you read it now, and you, your hair curls, it's just tough stuff. But it is the world in which they live. And we're going to report that kind of thing in this. But what this does is it goes to every public debate. 1872 is what you got to say. 1872 is when they first went. You see, it was pretty hard to go public before then because the roads were too damn good. And there wasn't much public around, frankly. And, so, you know, I mean, the train is, isn't uh, really running in the same way that it allows the society to name things. So this book has another theme that's it's not apparent. It, and, the, and the narrative one will definitely have a theme about how tech and transportation transforms today and what it makes possible and also sort of fatalistically creates it in some ways. So this section is the debates. It's like all the names. The newspapers didn't always agree with what's in the yearbooks, which didn't always agree with what was in the student paper. Once that started, but that starts pretty late relative to these, these affairs. And 
I put in crazy footnotes, fun stuff I find. The waiter doesn't show up as Spanish blue. Uh, you know, it couldn't be there. Or uh, the debate was with a uh, joint debate with, with Trinity. And, and of course, maybe they didn't show up because they all decided they were ill. Trinity, of course, is Duke. Not <laughs> and, and all kinds of things like that. Just endless amounts of kind of fun footnotes. Let's talk about a couple of those fun footnotes. Yeah, so the literary societies, how did they govern themselves? And what are some interesting stories you found about how the students treated each other when they stepped out of line? And what were some of the ways they stepped out of line? I'm debating right now in my own head whether I should tell the story, but it's a pretty damn friendly audience, hopefully. <laughs> um, they, they, they have constitutions, they have constitutional wars constantly, they're always redoing the constitution. The constitution was pretty central. And there's two young folks in the audience here who are now in charge of the current Philomendian society trying to develop a constitution, and the arguments they have are somewhat similar. Oh, yeah. and, and, uh, and so that's kind of interesting. They kind of self they were kind of self-independent units. They had faculty advisors, but it's not clear to me there was enough faculty or that that faculty thought that was their role to be involved in any way. They sort of showed up ceremonially in the ceremonial sense, but it's not, they, they kind of ran themselves and they kind of ran the school as a result. You see early on the societies, literary societies, which had debate every week, Sometimes twice a week, uh, debates and everything. So they debated a lot because what else was there to do in Wake Forest in those days? And, uh, and it was pretty cool. They they uh, kind of ran the school. They ran the society. They they ran the anniversary things. They ran graduation for quite a while until the administration decided they could run it better. And the society decided they couldn't afford it. They paid for most of this stuff. So most of the social life and the while the intellectual life that was invented was through the societies, not through the university. Because the university at this point, I think about their, their teaching wrote Latin and a few other things as the core and, and physics and hard sciences. And that, that was pretty much it. We don't get a public speaking course, but they kind of get one eventually, but it's 1900s past. And, uh, and so it's kind of kind of a different world. So based on your research, what will an undergraduate be fined for urinating out the window during the middle of a debate meeting? Okay. <laughs> I guess I can talk about that example. <laughs> this is in one sentence. This is in their notes, right? In one sentence, there's a sentence in there in which they're lamenting the fact that they need to honor Stonewall Jackson more and make sure they get his picture for the wall of the society room. This is post-Civil War. This is kind of the, you know, we're going to reinvent history war period. And, and it does happen. So they are debating that in the same sentence. They find this kid for peeing out the window. And they get fines for everything. You get fines for talking when you're not supposed to, for walking in front of the speaker. And he goes, oh, no, no, I don't know. I won't have a chapter. But I can have a big, day paragraph on fines in this narrative book where we are. It'll be kind of fun. Um, those are so many stories on those. They, yeah, that's enough. Because they, they, they were on the third floor. And it's a long ways to go down. And it was probably winter. It was cold. And they couldn't keep the damn stove running anyway. They fought with the league and growth of the administration for 25 years. And, and so, and they're 18 year olds. Somebody peed out the window. <laughs> Okay, let's let's return to the flavor of the book. Then. It was a little different question. Oh, it was ten. How much was the fine? Do you remember the fine? Uh, remember the fine? How much was oh, it? Oh, uh, they also use these fines to finance all these other things, right? And as, as well as some taxes and, and levies, and subscriptions, and things like that. Uh, they were usually fifty cents to a dollar at the most, sometimes twenty-five cents. But in the times. I have done a bunch of the conversions on these, so I'm going to actually report how much that would be in today's terms. But they were probably about 25 bucks or something, maybe in today's terms. <laughs> <laughs> the current 18 year old said that was worth it. Okay. Yeah, well, <laughs> if you think about that, if, you're, if it, it's really cold and you're on the third floor, 25 bucks and you're one of the rich kids, might be worth it. Right. <laughs> you know. 
Okay, okay we have a hand of Elliot, yes. You got rid of the fine, so how do you finance yourself? He said public donations, which we're not going to talk about right now. Public, with all these public donations. <laughs> <laughs> public donations for this. Yeah, yeah you're, you're, you're toast. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Elliot is a student in class, and we do this regularly, so I'm not really being mean to him. Well, I am, but he, he kind of knows the game. It's okay. All of you all that had class with Dr. Loudon know this game and have played it many a time. Uh, you'll note that many of you all, when you had class with Dr. Loudon, he would wander the class with the microphone and stop right on you and ask you a question that you couldn't run from. Uh, thankfully, we constrained him to the chair. Up to the <laughs> um, let's go back to the process of creating the book. So this book is it, mostly a list, a group of lists, facts. They were, they were created over time. There are some narrative sections where you introduce and, and work through writing some things. Um, tell the audience, what is the thing that you found most surprising about trying to introduce why some lists had been kept over time period? I mean, there, there were some senses in which, oh, go ahead. Why, why we have data from some points? Yeah, why is it that, that we have some and we have no, here, not here, others? Here, here, example I meant to talk about earlier, I just forgot we were talking about this, um, post-Civil post War, the school reopens. But it's reconstruction, and the federal marshals occupy much of this part of the country. And and Wake is poor as a church mouse at this point, and is for a long time. And in the newspapers, which is where you go to verify these debates and the and the names and that kind of thing, by which you can do now because they have all these old newspapers online, which is way cool. Wake's kind of not there from about 1865 to about 1885 at least, or even longer, it just kind of disappears from the newspapers. And that kind of makes sense because they probably weren't exporting their own existence much. There are periods in which data doesn't show up in newspapers because probably somebody forgot to send it out in real life. Or there are periods in which everything is covered, the whole, debate the whole thing is verbatim you've got the pictures and the drawings like the wall street journal or something of the debaters and uh and you have word for word verbatim debates full and that happens quite a bit and it depends on the time period and the other half of this is in the more modern period when you go to a tournament kind of world which uh 1830 essentially on or uh, 1930 essentially on then you it depends on who's running the program all right so, that's what i thought we would get so let's let's talk to you about your your time with the data collection because it's really invaluable oh I, i'm a mess well I, let's i keep everything let me give a little preview here okay so dr loudon isn't an alum of the program of course we're hearing more about the story when you showed up later this evening but when did you start thinking that your task was to pay attention to the history of Wake debate and to start keeping the lists, many of which we relied on heavily for the book. Pretty incremental. Uh, I think that I always, when I was undergrad, and if I really had my druthers and thought you could make a living, I would have been a history major. I love it, and still do, and sort of see the world from that point of view. So it always was relevant to me to achieve cut records of that sort. And it started because we didn't have computers and things, right? So I kept full notebooks of every debate. And you know, have some of you, Marsha, did you put it up online? Marsha has an example of where we get booked to the debaters of every single debate they had in their entire career and who the judge was, side win, all the whole nine yards. And she found hers and put it up online this week, and that was pretty cool. Um, so I always had records in that sense. Even then, you kind of miss things once in a while. And then, of course, there are other kinds of coaches who are coaching to win for good reason. And they, they see their job as the, the future or the immediate. And I, I get that. And so Ross and I were a good team because Ross would give a doubt about the history or keeping it. But he was really good at getting to the future and winning it. And so that was uh, pretty important. That was a nice comment. That was one reason to compliment, I think. And uh, some coaches were kind of historians at heart. 
um, Merlin Hayes, uh, people like that. They kept records of their most everything. Frank Shirley, sometimes, not too often. <laughs> but you could still get newspaper accounts and, and you get to things and the old gold and black still covered everything. There are old gold and black issues in which there are like 10 articles on the bank in one issue. So there was a time in which that was kind of central to the culture. And, uh, and of course it gets squeezed out, various societies get squeezed out because compared to what else you could do, probably became a little boring to do a debate every single week. Uh, and then, you know, and other things like and then sports, of course, had you can that 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 linear relationship is pretty clear to me. Anyway, I can't document it per se, but I would sure see it when I'm looking at the papers. Uh, and the student paper probably as much as anything, actually. You can see it most clearly. I don't know if that answers your question. It does, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to pause here before we transition on other stuff. Questions people have? Do things come up to you so far you're interested in? All right, we'll keep going then. Okay, so when people get their hands on the book later, what would you direct them to that would be something that they may not know was worth taking a look at? They, obviously, they might look for themselves or look at winners and things, oh, but what would be something they I might say, hey, Kind of hard time going there, there are a few people in the room who are old enough to remember the Sears catalog. <laughs> the book is almost heavy enough you can do a doorstop with it and fold the edges, you know, and you make the round thing. So uh, most of you are looking at what the hell. Um, but if some of you remember. Um, it has that utility. If you, before you do that, before you do that, you might want to look at the opening section. I think the opening section is Quite interesting that we had to figure out how to do that because it doesn't lend itself apparently to any kind of formatting a human machine made by humans understands. So this is really all just a PDF. Thing. So it has four columns and column one says something like uh, uh, events in debate history. Wait, debate history, that's right. Starting in 1835, but there weren't many events other than the first where they started, which was a pretty big event, I guess. Uh, and uh, so in the next First column, go soon has right up to Amber's winning the Zigger Miller Award this last year at Senior Nationals, or at NUT, I'm sorry, excuse me. And, and, and one of the coaches. Um, um, that's one column. You might take a guess on the number of graduates from Wake Forest's first graduating class. Very small. Two. We got we're close. It's four. <laughs> four from <laughs> that first class. Four. Everybody had Norway pretty well, didn't they? <laughs> so the first, so the left column, Wake debate history. Yeah, the next column, Wake coaches and Wake presidents. Wake coaches and Wake presidents. So you can see when triple and. And when the uh, when uh, Quisenberry and Quisenberry was a record keeper, by the way, he was a self promoter that was pretty cool. So he and he got some cancer or whatever and died overnight, and it's kind of unfortunate. And that's where we the fellow gets lost in World War II. There's going to be all kinds of fun narratives. Maybe we'll go there next. Um, column two, and you can see these things side by side in time as time unfolds. Column three is tech and. Uh, um, uh, transportation, what's happening in the world. And column four is major events in world history or the U.S. history that are happening contiguous with this. So, for example, 1835, they found the two societies, and the president is Andrew Jackson. That gives me a sense of the time. And I think that section is really kind of fun to go through just because just it's fun. It's that kind of chronology, is right? of seeing what was happening at the same time. And it's kind of sort of says that we actually exist in worlds that work for us that are part of, but not controlled by some international notion we've seen often. That what we really live in is a different reality than that. Okay, so you made, you made it a point to make it a full column and you made a reference to it, but tell everybody why technology and transportation play such a central role in the history of the Bay program. When I first went to Wake Forest, it was 
it wasn't anywhere. It was an institute. It wasn't a college for the college out for about five years, I believe. Is that right? Something like that. And uh, I think that's right. And um, the roads leading out of town either were mud or were plank roads if they were lucky. So getting a wagon or whatever to Raleigh was probably an all day event and could make it worse, I suppose. You don't get the railroad. When the railroad came in, I forget. Um, they finally put a railroad through. Uh, the only one in North Carolina at that point, as I recall. 1874, the railroad stations relocated close to campus. Well, that's when relocated, yeah. yeah. When they started building railroads. It was 1855, you had yeah. the first railroad train across. So, so basically, you're getting railroad just because of war, and the school's 24, 30 years old, right? And, and uh, so that's kind of interesting to me because when they had a railroad, they had, it was in a town called Forestville. Which was a town about a mile south of Wake Forest. And the town, I think, I use loosely. I don't think they were very big birds. And uh, and the post office was there, and the railroad was out there, and so they'd go there and get their mail. And so the students, daily or whenever, they wanted to, to, to walk down that mile to get their mail and then walk back to campus. Well, they called it the promenade. Just think about it. It'd be kind of cool because you would actually stop and talk with everybody because you knew them and and you would have time and you're sort of hanging out and probably rolling around. I think that would probably work out for the community beautifully. Well, they had a big fight about who got the train station and Wake Forest ultimately won. And part of that fight was some church in Forestville. And I don't remember why exactly, but there was a Wake faculty member on it. So they lost the train station, so they kicked him out of the church. <laughs> I remember that. And, uh, once the train station is right in front of the campus, near the old gates, which they replicated here, then it changes the world. Then you get the option of having debates, because there were public debates between colleges around the country, starting in the Northeast, primarily in some of the Midwest before the South. Probably a transportation question, actually. I don't have evidence of that, would be my guess. And they, they would, uh, then you could schedule a debate with Randolph Bacon. Or you could schedule a debate with uh, even Baylor eventually. But basically, you scheduled your Wake Forest. You scheduled debates with Baptist schools who were on railroads. And then you would have the debates, right? So the railroads really mattered in all kinds of ways, and you get to Raleigh quick, and then you could have Anniversary Day and Society Day, which is really an opportunity to get a date if you're in an all-male school, because they bring Meredith up in the other colleges, <laughs> and that, that really kind of central to their description of those days when you're a student in their publications. Uh, uh, so anyway, they, they, they have all that. Um, so the, they become very important. No airplanes, uh, no, and then of course the new tech. I mean, the tech has transformed not everything in our lives in a way that we probably couldn't even see at that time because it happened more incrementally. But boy, it makes a difference. And uh, will debate be aided or destroyed as we know it? Will world culture disappear into Instagram? I don't know. You know, all this kind of stuff is the jury's out, like all history. So that's why it's kind of fun. That's why I think the transportation and the tech stuff is, is pretty defined more than I I've always had that notion, but I didn't have any, I have quite a bit of evidence now. And some of the stories are fun, like when the first car shows up, and the kids show up to be recruited and they take them downtown and see the car. <laughs> <laughs> so there will be a lot of fun things in there. But hey, Brian. Dr. Lane. Is it time for questions yet? Please yeah, do. Time. Is this on? <laughs> you may well be scared. Uh, when did the school go co ed? And who or when is the first female <laughs> participating in a public or competitive debate? They are not the same date. And the first female who participated in a public debate, as I recall, was before women were admitted. Is that right? Sorry. And, and it, Nancy Easley, my That's right. Nancy Easley's father, I believe, taught as a professor. 
And so the staff, like maybe, and I don't know how that worked in those days, the professors, kids could go to Wake Forest, and if they were female, it was okay. Now, why so 1941, yeah, women so, are admitted to Wake Forest as then, an institution. Then the real change comes because there's too many guys off in World War II and they need bodies. Like most things, it gets happened. We need we need women to vote because we need enough people to become state. There are reasons that these things happen. And this is the kind of thing I can speculate in on the book in a way that I probably ought not to. All of this is not this is recorded. <laughs> I take it all back. I take it all back. Speaking of technology, you can't speak any of that. Right. That's not right. something that's important. But yes, that, that guy. That guy was speaking on the first floor. That was the third floor. So in in this room, maybe we have snippets of uh, our own histories or interactions in and out, maybe over. 60, 50, 60 years. Uh, but I, I doubt that many of us or any of us have kind of the, the range of history. So coming out of the 1800s and into the, say, 1960 to present, uh, what, if any, themes emerge uh, from your looking at all of that together and having that kind of uh, all historical arc uh, that we can get? <laughs> 1960. Yeah. Well, uh, they're not here to see me. But um, <laughs> so Dr. Loudon has assigned me Franklin R. Shirley to the day for the volume. It will be volume two. But, so, but I'm not going to answer this. I'm going to let Dr. Loudon. Because the question that was asked here is this broader theme, and you have the perspective to see yeah. So what are the broader themes? I don't know how to. The theme kind of throws me out there because I'm not sure how one uh, categorizes or typifies that way. What you have is different eras of, of, of kind of activity, if you will. And, uh, and, and this is how I sort of put it together in my head. And so you have this internal society kind of period up until this for the civil, past the Civil War, by 20 or 15 years. Then you got until 19, early 1900s, you have public debates for the public, but that meant in the state, and local, and the real public, right? And you haven't gone to what I call the intercollegiate debates, which is like going school to school. And there are years in the later part of that, at the end of the 1930s, where they're doing public debates at schools at maybe 30 schools. But it starts out much more modest than that. It mostly starts out in 1897 with the very first debates, first five, which I think most of you are familiar with, with Trinity University. Uh, and Trinity, of course, as we know, becomes Duke. And we also know that they got teed off and pulled out when they lost the two out of three and lost the cup, which is in the trophy case over there. <laughs> and, and, uh, and we think that makes sense given everything you know about their history, right? Post. I'm sure that's not true. We were able to research and find out that there really were reasons because basically the home team picked the judges. And three of the top four, two, three of the five debates have been hosted by Wake Forest, which is what got, got Trinity so excited. And, uh, but they just didn't see the, so they pulled out, but they didn't tell Wake. They had a society. But I was able to find in through the Duke Library the actual minutes of their literary society in which this happens. And so we have some fun stuff we can play there. Uh, there's an intercollegiate period. The intercollegiate period starts falling apart in the late 1920s. And the reason it does is because it becomes, uh, the, 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 the uh, public audience thing is probably worn out as well and somewhat because public lectures on everything everywhere in, the, in those days. And it got easier to get people there and the whole bit of the ante until you go to a new season on TV or whatever. Uh, and so, they, they kind of wear out. And one other thing that really happens is you got, well, it's a little cheaper to take two or three teams where there's three or four other schools, it's like a communication convention, and have all the debates at once and traveling all these places and doing the single debate for an audience. Well, hell, pretty soon you got a tournament. And tournaments for debaters are much more exciting than doing one after another public debates. 
And then the coaches start thinking about getting coaching in about that same period. You don't really have coaching until 19, well, until 40 years ago, uh, late 1930s. And, uh, and, and then they, they want to go and do well, and kids, that's what they want to do. And so, and they're the same kids. They're the same kids, Mark and Frank, when your period were the literary societies and were the debate team, but the debate team wagged the dog, is my guess. And that's what happened. So then you got this, this new the, the tournament period, what I would call it, until present and with the new online and all the other things that are happening coming out of our pandemic transitions. Maybe we're going to shift again, I don't know. I'm going to follow up a little bit on that question. I'm going, to, I'm going to give you a decade. You give me impressions. What is your impression of Wake debate in the 1960s? I've always heard you refer to this as a golden era, but is that is that really the case? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Martha Swain Wood, as mayor, followed Frank and Shirley, and did a better job, right, as mayor of Winston-Salem. <laughs> Frank, uh, and that's been my uh, for many years. Am I correct? So they, they debated at the end of that period, right in the middle, right in the middle of it. So you're much better to answer this question than me. Well, it was kind of a golden era. I mean, you won a ton, and they had a ton of really good teams, and they went to a lot of tournaments. And uh, this is a kind of getting Shirley on the road in the old fess of the old uh, station wagon or whatever it was, and that everybody came back it was always a miracle, as I understand it. And that was often written up in the paper. And, uh, it's kind of, kind of kind of fun stuff, but it was uh, it was a, one of the highlight periods. But of course, the whole world's coming down around you in the 1960s, right, the late 60s anyway, and all that's changing. So how does that intersect? Well, I can tell it didn't intersect much. I, I think the real drive for debate in that period, uh, late 50s and early 60s and 70s, and it was real strong in every school, was Sputnik, because keep up with the Russians. Was it, it was a lot of the thing that says we need to talk and have debate and have democracy and, and those kind of things that we value. And I think that probably, that and communication as a discipline getting some legs and getting the ability to uh, hire somebody for that kind of thing, or people to hire by the dozen girls in those days. So there were, it was not unusual. We would got, we went to the first couple, second years, third years, surely like 30 some tournaments. It's about to say, so I pulled it up. This is what you have listed in the book as the tournament's heyday. Coach Merwin Hayes in 1970 traveled to 39 tournaments. Yeah. I don't know if Merwin did. Well, that's, yeah, that's the coach that's right? That's fair enough. That's 39 tournaments for, for we average 16 today in, on our annual schedule, but 39 tournaments at the end of that era, 1960. They were a little quicker, a little shorter, and they were a lot, some closer. There was that. But I'm kind of curious how Merwin and people did it. This is a question for you guys. Who went? Because they couldn't have gone to 39. Not that who, close. Who, who went to the who was the coach or did just go? You just went sometimes. I don't uh, know the answer. Sometimes uh, Julian Burrow would go. Oh, okay. uh, Julian went sometimes. Yeah, I mean, he went to other people in the organization. Okay. Yeah. And I see Mr. Bond with a hand up there. Uh, <laughs> hey, uh, yeah. Well, well Keith, you know, too, because yeah. you were you love the chair. I came along in the fall of 68. Uh, and uh, Berwin had just started the year before. So we went to a lot of tournaments because the other thing that happened at that time is uh, first time we had grad assistants uh, uh, for debate. And so my spouse and Kenny Williams and Michael Hazen, yeah. and all those in this room, and Bob Frank, all were the four who arrived on campus in the fall of 69. Yeah, uh, and we had yeah. They, they were kind of split up, so they uh, each of them would go to several tournaments with a car full of uh, uh, debate and uh, getting to grow as a team at that time. Uh, and uh, the other thing I would I would add to that, just going, you know, I'm not sure if it's in the book or not, is that was the time period, the spring of '69, in the summer of '69, is when we started. A few of them started the 
the Baylor's research guy. Some of us came to the Baylor's Falls High School workshop that we attended at high school. All of that was going on about the same time. It's it's not in this form, but we have a bunch of stuff like that. So it will be one of the stories about that. And ultimately disappeared because of competition. Okay, so Mr. Vaughn brought up a really important question on the themes. Tell us about the role of graduate assistant coaches in sustaining and growing the history of Wake Debate. When you're in the room. <laughs> Well, well, it was wonderful. It was the best thing ever. That was amazing. <laughs> no, it really was. It was a lifesaver because you can't do it all. Um, because you're still teaching full time and as if you were regular faculty and all that kind of thing. You just can't do it all. And neither can I. But um, we've had a, we have a list. I don't know how many there are, but there's quite a few. Lydia, of course, was in that first class. It's my case and one other person I don't think you've ever met. Uh, I mean, maybe there were four. And, uh, there were four. Teddy Williams and uh, oh, Teddy was in that class. Teddy was in that class, and so was Bob Frank. Uh -huh. I've still got an APB. Uh, I'm still on a bulge, and I was looking for Teddy if anybody sees him. I've been trying to find him for a few years. So. Um, yeah, they, they make it all possible. They're, they're fresh, the players love them because they know the arguments and they're in the trenches and they kind of know what's happening. And, and they say they allow a director to direct more than seven, eight years, I think. And, uh, and I think that's the biggest part. And then, of course, they, if, if you don't have programs like this, then you don't have any coaches to hire. And part of the real problem with debate is having people to hire. And my, my thought on that is that when every school had a program, when all the directional schools and the regional schools, et cetera, had programs, you had kids that weren't coming out and going to the biggest firm from Harvard and Northwestern, et cetera. You had the Wayne Sayers and others. And that's when you got coaches. And that's what sustained it a lot. So losing those kind of schools makes a big difference. We still have the prestige schools, but we have less of the schools that are more likely, in my opinion, to produce coaches. And absent that, it's hard to sustain it within a department or within a university structure, within uh, you know all the things it takes to actually get funding in those kind of things. That's a great segue. Let's ask the, some of the broader questions. And so, some of the programs, the prestige programs you mentioned, they've been around. Other programs have come and go, and some of the prestige programs have come and go. Sitting now from your perspective, what would you tell this audience are the major variables? In is a program like Wake Debate making it from 1835 to today? What are the key themes that you saw over the course of the years that sustain the program? Well, like anything, and this, I don't mean this to be two year old horn kind of thing, it would survive, but like anything, it's personnel. And, you know, when they used to hire the coaches around the country, and I'd say, what would you hire? And I would say, well, then your program will be really good or really bad in five years. I may be gone, depending on who they are. Because you knew, you knew it's personnel in everything in the end. And, and that matters. It's more than that, though, because the schools that have sustained the Kansas, the USC's, the Wayne, a bunch of other schools have long histories. And those histories have the ability to wag the dog, at least politically, internally, somewhat. And so I think there's that, that makes it easier. So you got somewhere like uh, uh, um, Indiana, for example, which is starting a program, which is getting getting a, they've done come a long ways. So I'm pretty proud of them. Uh, do you love to be here? I heard he was. Oh, you're here. Oh, well, let's talk about it directly. Let's talk to John. <laughs> um, and that, those are really important that we have those kind of programs. But again, Gilo comes out with the communication and stuff that's really and John kind of knows what's going on. It comes from Wyoming, so he doesn't really want to be in that law firm in New York City. And uh, 
Sorry, David. David's new law firm of money. You didn't do it better. Um, so, <laughs> um, you see what I'm saying? I, I just think that you need that. And, and that tradition does end up mattering. I don't know why exactly, because it should have nothing to do with it. And somebody could come in and still kill it, I'm sure. But that tradition ends up <coughs> moving things. That tradition handcuffs. Not in a bad way, but in at least you get your voice way. Administrators here, I think. It's not, a, we have that lovely trophy case and we'll have and other kind of things, which are sort of little shrines to debate and say, oh, well, that's really neat. You got a thing to debate. And I was thinking when we put that trophy case of Merlin Hayes trophy case, he said, this isn't about the trophy case or what's in it. This is a fact that every administrator has walked by the damn thing for the next hundred years. And they realize this is what Wake Forest is partly about. And it's hard to throw away traditions. We've never been to the point where you had to mobilize you guys, which I think would be really ferocious. <laughs> but we've never had to do that yet. But I, I do think that's part of the tradition thing. Okay, so let's talk about that person now, the variable one. You've seen all the kinds of directors and debate coaches. You've worked with them, you've mentored them, you've observed them. Give us the key characteristics that make the personnel work. Well, if you're going to stay at this long and be stupid helps. Well, Ed's been in a long time. What would, how would you answer that question? <laughs> Can't stay sane. You've got to roll with it and be competitive. I'm better than we are, I think, in many regards, because of the, the landscape has changed. Um, you got to be a little dogged. Uh, I, there's many styles of work. I mean, even think that Ross and I had similar styles with the, you know, you're still <laughs> totally naive. Uh, but the combination kind of covered each other's weakness, I suppose. Maybe that's one way. Uh, it's still personnel, uh, and yeah, I, I because every time I think I was thinking of things here that well, it would be nice they had this quality, and I think well, but this person doesn't, they're fine, they're pretty good. Well, let's go to the extreme then. A person that you get the job and you say that program won't exist in five years. What are they doing? What are they doing in that five year period? They are. They don't. They're not committed to it in any way. They they are about their own other career options or somewhere just most of the time when there was a program killer we had names for them so we called them we called them program killers we would talk about them right i mean we would have these conversations uh, they usually have a crack record so they didn't just kill one program <laughs> <laughs> um, so sometimes up to three or four before and i, I don't really understand the ministers people are putting stuff together we don't get that and, 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 you know, but the, that, that's, I don't I'm not sure I should say more. Than okay, excellent. <laughs> let's, let's go back then to, to Wake Forest. So the debate team was not always housed in the communication department because the communication department wasn't always a part of the university. So tell us a little bit about, from your perspective, what has been the advantage and disadvantage to being a co-curricular activity with the debate team housed in an academic department versus, you know, an honors college or something else. Well, once you convert enough of the faculty that they have sort of become your cheerleader or exponent, then there's only advantage of being in a department. Uh, there's advantage because you got political cover. There's advantage in terms of uh, something to evaporate. There's the, all the institutional, organizational kind of reasons. And, and there's a myriad of those because you're just out there on your own and somebody lops you off, no one really knows it, you know. So there's that. But there's not much of an advantage of being in a department in which your funding is not separate. Think about that. If you're in a department, they can brag about you and say, we do this. You job be worth something to them. And that's fair. But if your money is dependent on somebody else thinking they want, five professors in organizational columns instead of four, then you're in trouble. 
So if you can keep the money separate, you will survive. But having the organizational structure, it, I think is really useful. Now, it can be doubt out that there are models in the country where people are not doing that, of course. But most of the people in this room who have programs are of that model. Frankly, they're in the in departments or in some kind of uh, institutional organization or unit. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk money. What was the debate team budget when you arrived in 1970? <laughs> yeah, well, this is interesting. John and Sue were here, and among others, and and uh, and they, they hired this young kid out of a community college in Wyoming. And, and I, I think that he did a double take on that. And you go, what the hell? I was going, what the hell? I was the kid. And, <laughs> and, and, and so I, I, it had to be kind of an odd thing to put up with. Uh, I, I will say this, I took a cut in pay from the community college to come to Wake Forest and the budget was smaller here than it was where I was. And we started really terrible. I, mean, I was like 12,000 or something, not much. We, we, you know, we stopped the, in people's houses, we did all that nonsense and save money. But that there's something valuable about that as well. A little suffering brings people together sometimes. And uh, and, uh, and yeah, you're the suffering suffering, right? you agree? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so there, there, there's that. But what we did is we basically, in those days, you just basically incremental them to death every year in the budget process. And kept up in it. And that kind of quit. They got better controllers or vice presidents or whatever. And so that kind of quits. And so nobody gets anything unless they decide so. And uh, things stay stagnant. Uh, so now it's become kind of a model which Jared's much better at. And I was, I could think it, but I couldn't seem to pull it off of external funding and uh, bigger funding. And Jared's managed that. And I think that makes makes the, gives them opportunities to do all kinds of things, even experimental things that we probably did not have or probably didn't even think of actually. So that's a positive. I think Brad had a question. Come on. Uh, so you've been going back through all these years, looking back just during your tenure, is there anything particularly surprising that you found that you either had forgotten about over the 45 years or something you didn't even know about at the time that you've only discovered in retrospect? Oh, in, 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 in the whole research process for all three volumes. Yeah. For all three volumes. Okay, so I can go back further in history to protect myself. Yeah. Yeah. Surprises. <laughs> I mean, there are things that I'm not sure what to do with. I mean, first of all, I think there are some negative things that happen. There are some uh, retention of various things that can happen when you're in an institutional organization. There are incidents, okay, he's not here. He won't tell the story finally. Brian Lane's here, he did. One Harvard for the first time. And damn, is that gonna be a celebration? I'm gonna rub everybody's nose down. <laughs> we are ready. Well, one of the grad students decided that it would be good to tar talk up on the tarmac in Boston with federal agents on the plane. And that worked out real well. <laughs> so when I got that phone call, I thought, well, okay, so much for winning Harvard. We had a little damage control for a few days here, which we did, and it all, all worked out. Uh, I, so there, I, I have, when you put something like that in there, you put things in that are, you know what I mean, they're a different quality of, and they're kind of history. And if they were in 1835, you put them in a heartbeat, right? I mean, I'm not, I don't have any notion of putting a paragraph in there about somebody peeing out the back end and filling up books in the in ZSR, which they did. You know, so I'm not going to put that in there. I don't know. Uh, your question again is what was the surprise? Here's, here's an example of the kind of thing that's kind of cool. I'm doing work putting together stuff for the Society Day, which they kind of invented as a a debate day, but a, a social day as well. And so it was in the spring because Founders Day was in the fall, and this gave the university uh, kids a holiday, essentially, and, and a big celebration, and people would come to school. Um, I was looking through it, and I found all these newspaper things, and I found this one thing where, where uh, they were dedicating a plaque on Society Day 
as part of that process. And the governor was there to do it. And the president of the college made a major speech, as did a whole bunch of other people. And it was all played out big time in the paper. And I said, well, why is this? Why are they doing a plaque? Well, I found out three years earlier that they're doing it to a, to a pilot that had been killed in a stunt in Vermont, actually. And uh, this pilot, uh, Pascal, in his books, only referred to the sentence, because Pascal, those are good books. My first three histories are really good. I recommend them. But uh, the, um, he only has one sentence in a footnote. This kid went to France, left college to go to France to train the pilots to do the little biplanes before World War I when they were all wasn't around knocking each other down, right? The Red Baron and everything. So this is what this guy did. But he comes back. There is starting to get a building of an industry. They want to sell airlines as safe enough for people to actually use them sometime. And of course, we're not close to that yet, but they're still trying to go there. So they have all these national races and races around the country. And this guy's a hotshot pilot. So he enters and wins the like 10 or 11 day transcontinental, first transcontinental airplane race. And of course he was a debater, he was a society member and everybody was. And so he, 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 he uh, wins this thing. And why is he cool? He's on the headlines in the New York Times and the Chicago Tribune and all the papers in big print, and they went day to day unfolding narrative of where his plane landed, the farmer changed his engine and he got caught in the storm and the elves crashed in the mountain in Utah and on and on. It was like high drama. And seven guys, pilots, I think they were guys in those days, were killed in that race. So it was uh, pretty dicey stuff, right? Well, why, why him? Well, he was articulate. He was good looking, had a cute wife and two kids. And he had a dog, Trixie, who rode in the back seat of the plane. And he was known as the flying parson. And so he was the most famous person potentially in the country for that two year period as a Wake Forest grad, because he had come back three years earlier to speak at the Society Day. And he came over and buzzed the train station as the girls from Meredith and Oxford showed up at the train station. That was a big hoo-ha event. That was pretty cool. But he couldn't find anywhere to land. They don't have airports. And he tried to land a field and there was wind blowing. So he had to go back, go back he had to fly back to Raleigh and he and the governor drove over. She got there late, but he gave a speech. So he was the most famous alumni of the school at that time for that moment in a debater, and he disappears in our history. He's not part of our mythos. So you find those kinds of crises that will be fun to tell and then to now have the ability because of the way newspaper archives work to actually do research. And there's also some correctives coming to Pascal, as good as he was. He didn't have access to all the newspapers. He lived most of the world now, but uh, he didn't have access to all the newspapers, et cetera. So we can go and actually not change his stories, or what I think of as the myths of Wake Forest, but more to extend them and to enrich them. Uh, Jared's going to help me on this one, but murder at you, which the federal marshals come in and pull out an invader and send him to prison with the reconstruction period for a lynching. The debate team at the time barricades the door when the marshals show up, and the debate team starts arguing with each other about whether or not they're going to try to fight the marshals. And eventually, the kid agrees to go out and is arrested for a lynching in Raleigh. Yeah. And the rest of the story kind of thing is he gets in prison. Of course, with Grant, who I think was a really remarkable president, to be honest, given everything that was coming down for him. Uh, Grant uh, puts him in prison because he keeps the law in order and he keeps the reconstruction period and the federal marshals. But he lets people out fairly quickly as well because he doesn't want to piss everybody off entirely and the whole thing fall apart, right? So this kid gets out because they start leaning on him and they send letters to Grant. The letters are initiated by a Wake faculty member who gets all kinds of blowback in the papers. 
saying, what the hell are you doing? Just like what we now on social media, right? Basically, you're just doing it in slow motion. And they're getting all this blowback and they're criticizing him because he shouldn't be doing this kind of thing. Well, the kid get, does get out. And that guy gets scathed and, and gets played up a little bit in the, in the media. And seven years later, Taylor becomes the president of Wake Forest University. It's that kind of extension of story, which is kind of fun. I think the faculty member became the president. Yeah. All right, so I'm holding here. I'm, I'm, no, not quite yet. I think we're doing okay. Hang in there. Um, one, one of the things that brings a lot of the people here together is that it does have a tradition of success with Wake Debate. I'm looking here at uh, the overall tournament places, the top three appearances. So these are people yeah. who did semis or better. Yeah. And, you know, number one, do you remember the name off the top of your head from 1955? Who has the Wake Debate record for the most number of? That's right, Carwell Leroy with 20 finishes. Second after that, of course, is Adrian Barbero, John Hughes, and Virgil Warfield, who are tied at 17, if I'm reading this correctly. Brian Press is in at 60. But, you know, this 1955, we're participating in the very first NDT. We're winning what was the equivalent of the NDT the year before it was created, Phi Kappa. Why did Wake Debate, why has Wake Debate had a series of successes? And I think for a lot of the audience, they think of us as a, top 30 U.S. News and World Board Liberal Arts School, but that's not the case of the description of Wake Forest in this earlier eras. So yeah. what is it that made Wake Debate good at debate? I haven't thought about that, and I'm not sure no, but, and you know, you guys know, uh, Frank Shirley was, was kind of a self promoter and he was a politician. He was political. And he was heavily involved in the national organizations and getting to the NDT, which wasn't called it then, getting to the NDT was a, a selection process in which he applied. And, and so how your record was, was hugely important and very few teams made it. But I think where you were from and the politics of it were also important, to be honest, to some degree, when your school had rep and that kind of thing. And Frank was really tied into all that. He was a player if you will, on the selection process for West Point. And that had probably had something to do with it, I'm guessing. Not in the sense that he made it happen or it was unfair, but in the sense that that was the game he played. And then got the kids to the tournaments. I mean, that team, because at 55, I don't know, probably tournaments were not quite as, there were as many as there were in the 60s and 70s. And um, that, that, that's an amazing record, actually. Uh, it's an amazing record. Now that kind of chart in that book is fun. It's meaningless, but it's fun. Don't say that to Alan Coverstone, who's like seventh on this list. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I, I back you. The, the chart, Alan Coverstone is not meaningless. He's meaningful, but the chart's still meaningless. Now, here's why. It's because it's apples and oranges stuff. This happens throughout all these lists. And you start doing lists across the years. You start comparing things that are really not comparable. Like how can you compare a record of how many teams, how, how many times they got to the semifinal or better, which is kind of cool. Because it's like a sports page. You can look at it and you go, wow, maybe that person that happened. I like it. It's fun. But I don't know what it means. Because there were some times when people debated three years or two years, or they had a lot more tournaments they could go to, or they had a good partner, or who knows what happened. They're not really comparable. But there isn't anybody on the list that wasn't pretty damn good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to be conscious of looking at about 10 or 15 more minutes here before we start migrating over to the Parker Plaque. I minutes? think we, for some of us, we ought to start migrating now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for any hands raised to where I can, I can go to my way. I, I have categorized as closing sections here. But, okay, great. Uh, become more central to the debate team. Oh, uh, th this is happening. This is happening in uh, the late 20s, early 30s, and, middle, and really strongly by the early 30s. That, that pretty, the coup has pretty much happened. Because now you have, you have honorary societies, you have other kinds of forensic organizations that become more central. Uh, they become more, they, they retreat into 
uh, this is really good getting fired, okay? They retreat into more poetry and that kind of will we'll read something and commune with each other. So, uh, don't tell them the I said this. They, the literary societies move from debate societies, which are kind of active and fun and engaging and combative to humanities departments. <laughs> That's, that's an academic joke. It's not, it will not keep me retained. <laughs> Wes, does that, that, does that make sense? I don't know. It, it's tricky, but that's what it happened. And I'm part of this transportation because the cars, part of that is uh, 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 <coughs> just we tournaments were cheaper and, and cooler and more fun. So, Al, we all know you've been involved in the program for going on five decades, probably 30 plus as director. Or are there other yeah, had to remind me of that? <laughs> so are there other contemporaries in the modern era and other programs who, who would be the closest in terms of having had that length of tenure in the program? You're referring to people who are still alive? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's several. You got, uh, of course, before me, Don Parsons or South Forest or people like that. There are a number of them. Um, um, Melissa. Hmm? Melissa, right? I think you were younger, but she got much, right? Very close. Very close. Pretty damn close, actually. She probably was debating me when I was debating in my, uh, nah, I'm probably older than her, actually. Well, I know I'm older than her, but how disastrous it is. Um, I, I, that's a good question. I'm trying to think of others. I know there are. Uh, I got a nice note. Some of you might remember B. Wayne Calloway. Ah, uh, yes. He was a big, big power broker at the time. And I got notes from all kinds of people. It was just a sort of overwhelming. And uh, they all bring back different memories. But there, there are, we're losing some of those people, of course. Uh, who used to be at Aquaria? He's still, he's pretty active in putting stuff out. Um, David Thomas and so on. People like that back there. Was. So, yeah. It's, uh, in terms of active coaches right now, but I don't think that's necessarily what that's about. I just want to say this to the audience. Do you, all, do you all know that Dallas Perkins judged the finals of the Shirley in the past two years? Like Dallas wow. Perkins is, is not just the round. Dallas Perkins yeah. is an active argument coach judging the finals of the Shirley. I would like to, to kind of go to that as our uh, as our closing areas, which is some of the aspects of Wake Debate that aren't captured in competition, but make up the program's history. So tournament hosting in particular, I'd like to turn there for a quick second. Tell us about what it was like to follow the tradition of Franklin R. Shirley of thinking of the tournament as such an important part of the debate community and, and what are your memories that you'll take with you as you transition out of the official academic role of what it's like to host the Shirley for the people in the room who did it with you but weren't necessarily in the room to make the hard calls. So this is a setup question depending on how I answer it. A good setup point. The Franklin Shirley for four decades has been voted among coaches. Uh, Take your help to get the vote. Uh, the top tournament of all four of the decades. Now there are reasons for that. And part of the reason is it was always one of the ones, <laughs> here's the truth, everybody came to it, right? And so it was bigger and it was the fall national championship and people labeled it different things. Well, part of the reason it was bigger and everybody came is because everybody bigger and everybody came. If you could not come, right? <laughs> you had to come. So it still has has that. The other thing that the show did is it was a place that was big enough as a tournament. You didn't have to be elite to have a shot. And because there was enough middle, if you will, to get a record to clear at that tournament. Uh, and, and that wasn't true of all of them especially in the early days when I was here. And, you know, we had to make the list, right, as we said. Uh, and uh, so that, that's quite different. The other thing that, that the Shirley's done, and that was true for Northwestern for a while, and a couple other people have given it a shot, is that it's that innovative. It has enough clout to actually try things that change the activity, like how long is a revival. And Ross was, of course, pretty instrumental in a number of those changes because he was going to win and take off and do it, you know. <laughs> so it was Russell. And, and that kind of active leadership, I, I think 
it makes the Shirley special and, and it's also a lot of hostility. And here's another whole angle you can go with on that. That's kind of interesting is that the Shirley wasn't always the Shirley. Shirley was the something, something you could see classic. Uh, and it was basically Frank Shirley's notion of Southern hospitality. Because Dixie Classic was the fair, right? It's right across the street. And, and he wanted to show hospitality, so that's what it was called. And the Dixie Classic held court for a long time. We just called it the Dixie. I remember one year when I was running it, which is also off the record since we're not being recorded. I ordered uh, and put it in the bathtub for the Coaches party a uh, whole bathtub with ice of Dixie beer, which you get in Louisiana. And so, <laughs> right, did it still have it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't even <laughs> uh, and uh, so, but but that became problematic. It became problematic of what Dixie meant. And Dixie meant different things to different audiences, understandably. And we were lobbied by one of our sister institutions in the South here with more prestige than we have privately in a good in the way that I found acceptable. I found a letter about doing this research that I had sort of defended the fact that Floyd had produced me over it. But I actually put out once because I was mad about something after treatment and some vandalism and that kind of thing. So I did that once in a while I had a little temper. And uh, but I was wrong. And we were lobbied by that school. And we didn't really talk about it much. We just did it. He said it will be the Franklin Sherman tournament, it will not be the Dixie tournament because that carries connotations that we do not intend. We know Frank Shirley would have approved of the kind of mayor he was. We think the first run the African American student here helped him run the junior tournament. I think you just so I can't confirm that yet uh, when he came here the first year. But that was not Frank. I could think he would have approved. That's part of that history. All right, final questions from the audience. If not, I'll leave you with that. Should hopefully be a softball. You had to think back on what you would hope this audience would take away as the description of the Loudoun era of weight debate. Because you can classify them sometimes in that way. You refer to it as the Shirley era sometimes. So if we're thinking about the Loudoun era, what do you hope people We'll think of when I think of that. Yes. I'm asking you. you what do you determine think? that yourself? Other people determine that. The social groups or whatever. It might be the nothing era. You know? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Don't tell this audience that. No, no. This audience is very friendly. Well, because they, well, they were part of the nothing era. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. But it was populated by really cool people. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I don't think I have any any ownership of that because that's not how those things work. So you're more likely to influence that. But we've used up all the good naming opportunities, so you're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, we have a room full of people who, who could make it happen. I'll tell people a little preview of something not for today, but for a future time. Wouldn't it be great if we had a distinguished alumni series named after Alan Loudon where the, the current debaters would get a chance to meet the alums that came back to campus? Go to dinner with them, talk about it. I feel like that'd be something to be amazing. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. For a time. Maybe we'll make some after the concert. And see. Okay, well, for the moment, though, any closing remarks for you, Dr. Loudon, that you'd like to share on the history of the debate or the book or anything well, else? I'm kind of curious how you're going to decide, other than that list is nonsense, who's distinguished, but that's another question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anything else? I think we're going to have a good time tonight. If the, uh, the the people who are speaking are, it could be any number of people in that audience who could do that just fine, thank you. But somebody had to be asked. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to that. And uh, it will be, I, I hope to get through it in one piece. And in, in a, in a, that, that dog sign got to me, so who knows? <laughs> I, I was looking at all the family faces on here and everybody and knowing all the faces. It is just remarkable. It is just remarkable. Thank, they Thank you them. all for being here. I think they would say you're remarkable and that's why they're here.
All right, everybody, let's migrate to celebrate Dr.